I've been asked by We Are Mac to moderate tonight's forum with our candidates for the mayor of McMinnville. Our participants are Kim Morris and Mayor Remy Drabkin. Thank you, candidates, for your participation. First and foremost, it's very nice to see my neighbors here because let's not forget we are all neighbors. I like the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. After all this is over, uh, we still live near each other and still shop at the same grocery stores and hopefully the local businesses as well. And we all care about the future of McMinnville, so let's, let's stay neighborly. Some ground rules. Audience, please be respectful. No booing, no interrupting, please. Candidates, please don't interrupt each other and stay within the time frames. You do not have to use all of your time. We'll show a green card when you may start, a yellow card when you have 15 seconds remaining, and I couldn't find red at my house, so we have pink for stop. <laughs> we didn't think of it to the last minute there. Please stop at the pink card. A coin toss has been determined so that the person who speaks first will be uh, Kim. And here's the format. Opening comments, uh, first person will speak three minutes. The second person will speak three minutes. The first question will go back to the first person for three minutes, and then it'll go to the second person. Here's where it gets more interesting. The next question goes to the second person so that each person gets to have the question first at some point. And it'll just go like that throughout the end of this. Also note, I wrote these questions, which means that I might have made some mistakes in my assumptions or interpretations. I'm sure that someone will correct me if that's the case. The candidates have seen these questions in advance. I did my best to avoid repeating or using questions that will be used next week, the October 24th forum being presented by the McBinville Chamber of Commerce. Many of tonight's questions were inspired by topics in articles in the News Register. I want to thank the News Register for helping our community to stay on top of issues affecting our city by their coverage of council meetings and much, much more. And these questions do not necessarily reflect the views of We Are Mac. Let's get started. Kim Morris, you may present your opening statement. Okay. So my opening statement is to tell you a little about me. So I've lived in McMinnville my entire life, been married for 44 years. I'm a business owner with multiple businesses. I own property and my, raised my family here. I worked in banking and I worked as a small business running that and understanding the issues that go along with a small business. I'm not a politician. I've never meant to be a politician in the sense of that word. But I guess everybody is a politician in some way. A politician is someone that needs to listen, that needs to hear and understand when someone's talking to him, to do what you can to help the person that's in front of you, to be fiscally responsible. And I think I can do that. I can bring people together, and I have. I have people that call me and ask for help, and I go and do what I can to help. I'm not a vigilante, which has been mentioned before. I'm someone that listens and tries to do positive change, and I will continue to do that whether I'm your mayor or not, but I hope that I can be your mayor. I was asked tonight by Todd Butterfield, what do you, what do you want to be called tonight? And I want to be called Kim. That's me. And I hope if I become your mayor, you still remember me as Kim the person that goes to the coffee shop, the person that's on Third Street, the person that you reach out to. And yeah, there's gonna be times that I have to use that title, but I'm always going to be Kim. And I'm here to listen to you. 
Mm, thank you. Thank you. Mayor Drapkin. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Oh, is my microphone working? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I greatly appreciate this. I think civic engagement is so important, and I work so hard to foster civic engagement in our schools and in our community. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work that I've done in the last two years as mayor. I've taken a keen eye to housing, which I see as one of the greatest challenges, if not the greatest challenge, that faces our community as a whole. And I've worked hard to address that at every level. We need housing at every level. Through my work, I've brought in and resourced dollars and assistance to open a navigation center, which will be a low barrier emergency shelter that will help people to start transitioning out of homelessness. From that, I've worked hard to bring in dollars for a transitional shelter, uh, a moteling program that has sustained a 67% success rate, meaning that people go into the program and 67% that leave exit to housing. It's a very high success rate for people in this work. I've also worked hard to bring in workforce housing, working with our state government and working with both parties to make sure that we're keeping McMinnville with the land supplies that it needs and working on focusing on workforce housing. Good governance has also been uh, one of my main drivers. Uh, I came into my public service in 2011. I started on the planning commission. Um, being a nearly lifelong McMinnville resident, I had attended a planning commission meeting for Habitat for Humanity and was surprised. Uh, to hear people that didn't want this great program going forward. And I applied for planning commission and went through a fairly brutal process of being interviewed by the council in a public forum in a meeting like this, having them deliberate about me in front of me and make a decision. Uh, I wanted to bring down barriers to being engaged in our process. So I've reformed the way that we do our advertisements for uh, for positions, for community positions that inform our government. That means that we now do advertisements in English and in Spanish. It means that we now advertise in the news register and on social media and through our website. I've always said that I'm in governance, not politics. Uh, politics, I feel, is like what gets put upon me. And I'm here for the good governance. And the good governance to me means that we, as a government, are working hard for the people of McMinnville uh, so that you have the infrastructure that you need to build your businesses on, to raise your families amongst, and uh, to live happily. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, the first question goes back to Kim. Kim, do you think it's possible for the city of McMinnville to operate effectively, that is, live within its means, based on current taxes and fees, or is it possible to cut back the way each of us does when we have a limited budget for our household? I think the city of McMinnville has an obligation to live, to live to live within its budget, and the budget is set by the taxpayers. So whatever that amount is, is what we need to work within. And with all the amount of fees assessed and taxes that have been raised, I find it hard that we aren't able to do that. And I would like to know where's the money being spent. I think it hasn't been quite transparent to the citizens as to where that money is. If I become mayor, I would like to call for a forensic audit to take a look at the books and be able to know, and I'm not saying there is anything wrong, but I think that we need to know. Not only myself, if I were to take over as mayor, but the council, and also the citizens. I hear it quite often on my campaign is, we're concerned about transparency and where's the physical responsibility. We need to know. We aren't getting monthly updates and or any updates as our citizens. I'd like to understand how we compare to other cities, both in income and expenses. And also, I feel like sometimes decisions are made and things are voted on and we don't know where's the line item that it's coming out of. I've been in banking, I've been running businesses, and I've always been required to know where's the money coming from. So I would hope that we can live within our means. I think we can live within our means, but it also does mean, like other families in the community, we need to cut if we need to cut. 
So you have to learn how to live. And I'm just gonna say is, there's no clock for me to look at. This one says one and that one over here. So just trying to turn it around. <laughs> okay, it's just different. So anyway, that's my answer. Um, I would hope that we can live within our means. I think we should and we can. Thank you. Mayor Drapkin. Thank you so much. <laughs> Budget is no doubt a huge challenge. Uh, for many of you that I see out here that I've grown up amongst, I know you were here when McMinnville was a town of 8,000 people, uh, not a town of 35,000 people, uh, which is actually probably an undercount, if we're being honest, because the census doesn't capture all populations. Um, and in that, through that growth, and especially in the last 20 years, our population has doubled, our budget has not. The city has been scrimping and saving. We, unfortunately, in the past, have foregone maintenance. Uh, that's why we have things like a wastewater conveyance system from the 1940s. We have other outdated infrastructure that needs taken care of. So are we able to live within our means? Absolutely. And we have a responsibility to the citizens to deliver clean parks, to deliver parks and rec programming, to have our library be open, to plan for future development, to invest in economic development, to master plan our airport and exercise everything that that asset can do for the city of McMinnville. And it's my intention to make sure that we give that to the citizens of McMinnville. Um, as I often talk to people about our budget, I come back to an example that I feel very relatable, um, which I, I talk about household growth. If you had uh, two more kids and your income did not increase, how are you gonna provide the same quality of clothing, the same quality of meals, the same quality of after-school programming? Are you gonna have the same car? Uh, you know, speaking of cars, our outdated fleets at not just the city, but also the fire department were one of our main drivers for being able to improve and bring better not just services but better infrastructure for the safety of McMinnville. That outdated fire fleet with 20 and 30 year old vehicles, we weren't hitting our response times and every single citizen in the city of McMinnville deserves public safety. Every single one of you wants that fire truck to show up in time and that ambulance to show up in time and so we have to work together to creatively solve problems bring in money from outside sources, which I have done repeatedly, and be realistic about the level of service we want and what it will take to get there. Thank you. Mayor Drab, can you get the next question first? Uh, the mayor has influence over who is selected to be on committees such as the Budget Committee. Do you think it could better serve McMinnville if an effort was made to represent the two major parties or major political viewpoints on committees? Um, I, I'm glad you asked that. It's actually something that I care a lot about. Um, I really see my job as mayor is to bring people together. And I don't know that there's a more important place than that, ha that, that happens than in a representational government. I mentioned this process that I went through to join the Planning Commission. Now, when we advertise, uh, according to the way that I mentioned earlier, with a lot, more, uh, a lot more messaging out to the community, we get so many applicants for our committees that we're sure to tell people in every single interview, please apply again. We want your service with the city of McMinnville, even if you're not selected for this committee today. Um, I've also changed the way that those interviews happen. So those interviews happen in front of an interview panel. A uh, person is not hand-selected by the mayor to serve on those committees. That is a community representative, a council representative, and a, and a representative from leadership, which is either the mayor or the council president. 
asking a set of questions to make sure that we are bringing forward uh, a more representative uh, democracy. Um, this reform in how we do committees has created more public involvement. And I think that is so important that we are all participating in our government system in whatever way we can. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, our job as a city is to provide infrastructure. And that infrastructure can be so many things, but it really is the infrastructure on which we build our lives. And so when I think about our infrastructure, about our sewer system, that's not partisan. When I think about our parks, that's not partisan. We may not always agree on the methodology to get to an end, but it's not partisan. And this is a nonpartisan race. And I proudly serve as a nonpartisan leader, bringing dollars that benefit the entire community, bringing resources for everyone, making sure that I'm improving our infrastructure so that we all benefit from that. Thank you. Thank you. Kim. I agree. I agree that we shouldn't be calling out any special interest groups. We shouldn't be calling out any political party. It is a nonpartisan job that we have, and we should be hoping for input and from thoughtful from all of people throughout our community and without bias. So it seems to me that the mayor sometimes has a little too much influence on some selections, and I feel like the council should really have more influence. Um, the mayor should have input in it, but not control. So we have lots of different committees. We have our Water and Light Commission. We have commissioners. And I feel, again, that we should allow more transparency in that than I feel that there is right now. And again, take it to the council. We, as a, as a city, we vote on councilors and our mayor. And that is who we should all be brought to to make the decision, not as much control by the mayor. Thank you. Kim, you get the next question okay. first. We have a new Housing Production Strategy Project Advisory Committee. Wow, that's a name. As part of HB 2003, they're required to draft a Housing Capacity Analysis, or HCA, every eight years and adopt a Housing Project Strategy within one year of completing the Housing Capacity Analysis. This is actually a big deal. It's been said by one member of that committee, according to an article in the News Register, that the price of land seriously constrains the end price of a home and that larger homes are more profitable for builders. I realize this is a new committee, but do you have a sense for whether local conditions are contributing to the problem of the high price of land, such as red tape, overtaxation, and fees, or is it due to state and federal influences on the economy or not? And do you think this House bill is helpful or just another level of bureaucracy that grows local government? Well, the two biggest factors in the housing crisis, as I see it, are supply and cost. Land availability, because it's a state land use laws, means that it has an impact on the urban, gro urban growth boundary. So again, supply and demand. You don't have enough land, the prices are going to be up. We also have state mandates that require reporting for our housing. That takes time and money from our planning department without any funding from the state to cover that. I think that as a city, as a county, as the League of Oregon Cities, the Mid Willamette Jobs Council, or Council of Governments, excuse me, and our local legislative representatives need to go to the state and explain what the burden is that's being put on us as a city in order to complete all the reports that they require without giving us any funds to do it. I know that's a big burden on our city. And you also kind of wonder, what do they do those reports? I think there's always reports that go in and what's the outcome from that? Do they use it in a positive manner or do they use it to manipulate a decision that they want further down the road? I don't know but I'm going to say that I think that we need help from our state 
to either do less reports or give us money to do the reports. I also know that we need housing. Um, we need affordable, we need workforce, we have properties. It's hard for me to understand that we need housing, but we've increased our, re our planning and our engineering to 100% recovery that adds a lot of fees to someone that wants to build a home. There are some discounts if they're doing some affordable housing, but still, everyone needs to be able to build a home and to do it within a reasonable amount. We're looking at park service SDSs as well. If you build a 2,000 square foot house, you're gonna be looking at, I think it's $13,000 to go towards new parks. Not maintenance, but new parks. That's a lot of money to put on a developer and to think that that's not gonna go to the ultimate end user who's buying the house is not realistic. We really need to take a look at what can we do to, to be able to help everybody at every level get into a home because we do have limited land. Thank you. Mayor Drabkin. Thank you. I could not agree more. Unfunded mandates for our city are burdensome, difficult to work through, and stop us from moving from planning to implementation. Recently, we had a presentation at the city council from our community development director who detailed some of these reports, a 5,000 page report that she had to submit that interrupted her actual workflow. At that meeting, I had multiple counselors say, I want the council to address this. Within, I don't know, the next day or the next week, uh, the next conversation I had with our state representative, I said, my council wants us to address the unfunded mandates that are interrupting workflow and stopping us from moving from planning to implementation. We have one counselor uh, who's a member of the Council of Governments that was mentioned. I specifically asked him if he would also raise this with the Council of Governments. We are doing that. Land and supply, I agree, absolutely. Do, does supply uh, uh, affect the cost of land going up? It does. That's why a failed UGB expansion that happened in 2001 meant that our building permits took a deep dive starting in 2010. We ran out of buildable land, essentially, as a city. And you compact that with the mass migration that we saw happen during the pandemic and people flooding our city that could make cash offers on houses. We've never needed housing more. We're a thousand units short of housing today. So what am I gonna do about it? Well, more of what I am doing, I'm gonna continue making sure that we carry out the things we've started. I worked with our state legislature, specifically with our state representative on House Bill 4134 called Housing Oregon's Workforce. Our tagline was, you wanna build housing? This is how you do it. Um, I'm proud of that, thanks. Uh, but what that did was it unlocked nearly 400 lots that had been approved for development in 2007. We need to invest in the city's infrastructure, the underground infrastructure, that makes all of this land developable. We need updated sewer so that houses can flush their toilets when, uh, after they're built. Thank you. Um, uh, so essentially, uh, we're very much in line here, um, except I'm already doing the work. Thank you. Mayor Drabkin, McMinnville continues to be adding layers to current programs to address houselessness. At the October 8th City Work Session, a man named Evan H. presented on the Transitional Housing Plan to fill the gap, specifically not, he says, for those with chronic houselessness, but rather those with vulnerabilities that include those with a disability or injury, who are fleeing domestic violence, are aging out of foster care, have job dis instability, have mental health issues, and or have substance abuse addiction problems. So I have a three-part question here. A. Does this project potentially duplicate any existing government and non-government programs and services in McMinnville? 
and B, to what extent does the addition of programs like this, in your opinion, or from research, create a magnet effect uh, drawing people from other cities, counties, or states? I guess that's only two parts. Thank you. Um, homelessness has been an issue in the city of McMinnville, in our county, and in other cities and counties for decades. The county produced a 10-year plan to end homelessness in 2006. Another effect of the last five years has been a dramatic increase in homelessness. There are some things we know about our unhoused population. We know many of the drivers, including some of the things that you mentioned, like domestic violence, which at one point was responsible for 14% of the reporting of why people were homeless in McMinnville. We need a whole system of shelter in order to be able to successfully transition people out of homelessness. And we need to do this not just because those people don't have housing and they are unstable. We need to do it because it destabilizes our community as a whole. I mentioned in my opening remarks some of the work that I've done on this. I'm very passionate about this work because I truly believe that everybody deserves a home. I believe everybody deserves to be able to afford a home, whatever that price point is. 36 room emergency shelter with wraparound services. The city has finished its work on it. I brought in the money to get that construction project done. It'll be owned and operated by YCAP, who is a service provider. Project Turnkey, that started as a motelling program. I drove a work group to get the funds together for that initially, and then partnered with the state. Project Turnkey is a state program. That is a highly successful program. And I've changed our codes. Now, people don't always like to hear about codes. That might sound boring. But the effect of changing our codes is real. You all may remember the apartment building that burnt down on Baker a couple of years ago. Well, because of the codes that I changed, what burnt down was 17 units. What rebuilt in the exact same footprint, at the same height, was 24 units of dedicated affordable housing. Changing our codes changes our outcomes. And homelessness is a multi-systems failure that re needs a multi-system response. Thank you. Kim. First of all, I agree with Remy in the fact that saying that homelessness and not chronic homelessness and listing all the items, most of the items listed are why someone's homeless and only exasperates the issue. So we do need to keep that in mind, that it's domestic violence, it's a loss of a job, um, it's a drug addiction. I support transitional housing, but I support it only if it's managed properly. And by looking at what was presented recently for transitional housing, I have some concerns. Um, one of them definitely being the fact that it can be placed in any residential area or commercial area, um, not industrial, but without also any neighbor input. We've talked and talked about people wanting a voice in this town and not being heard. And when we take that voice away, we're not helping that. So we need to help people that need transitional housing. I agree we need more, but we need to make sure they're successful at it and that we're not changing a neighborhood. We don't have children that are gonna be affected. So we need to take a look at that. So we, also, we need, do need to have input, but our communities before we just say it can go anywhere and you can't say anything about it. Um, I don't know what the statistics are about the magnet effect, if it's gonna bring any more in or not, but I can tell you that I volunteered for a point in time. 
That's counting all the unsheltered in the county, volunteering for YCAP to do that. So Mike and I volunteered for that, and there were 158 unsheltered. Some people question that number. I don't. I was out there in the rain counting, and I chose and requested to have the areas with the most amount of seen unsheltered. So Marsh Lane, Dustin Court, McDaniel Lane. I talked to every one of those people, and I would have to say that I, our group alone accounted over 36. So I was one that thought that a lot of those people were coming from out of our area, and I was wrong. They weren't. All but two of them were long-term residents of Yamhill County. So again, I agree that we need to help the homeless and we need to provide services to them. But I think we also need to keep in mind that we have different groups. So we have homeless that need help, need a hand up, that are trying. We have people that are choosing to be homeless and we need to understand that. It's a choice. Some people wanna live like a, you know, a gypsy, a transient. That's their choice, but we can't let that choice affect the rest of the community. And we also have crime, and I do not accept crime. We, have to, we can't enable people, and we need to hold people accountable. So if there's criminal activity, homeless or not, I don't care if you have a home or don't have a home in that regard, you need to be held accountable. Thank you. Kim, in the past few years, how transparent has the city been with counselors and city council meeting attendees to show the overall monthly state of the budget in some tangible paper forms that they can look at? Uh, for example, expenses per department, areas of deficit, and the like. They haven't been transparent in my opinion. So I've gone to almost every council meeting for the last two years, either attended or watched on TV or live. And I haven't seen financial statements. I'm not the only one that has asked that. I've never been involved in a business, a board, a nonprofit that doesn't see where we are financially. Those reports are given along with minutes as what happened before, what happened in the previous me meeting. So I don't understand why that isn't happening and I don't understand why it hasn't been happening for so long, especially when it's brought up. I've been in banking, for, I, banking or business running for over 40 years. To make a decision, you need to know where you're at. That's what that monthly statement is for. What expense line is that request coming from? How much money do we have left? What can we do with the money that we have? Do we need to cut back? So again, that's where I also call that I would want, if I became mayor, a forensic audit because I don't know where the city is. And I don't know how many people in this room know where the city is. And I think the city budget, again, been doing this for so long, and it is one of the hardest budgets to understand. I look at other cities, I've looked at other businesses, large corporations, and it is really difficult to look at that budget and really make sense of it. And again, you're only looking at, it at budget time, we don't get updates. So I would like to understand, and I'm concerned about the lack of transparency. Thank you. Mayor Drapkin. Thank you. Um, when I ran for mayor the first time, I ran on accountability, communication, and transparency. I do think those are three tenets of government that are so important. Uh, we propped up a new community engagement and communications department specifically to start increasing and improving the transparency of the city of McMinnville. I certainly hope that you have all gotten your iHeartMac.org free platform where you can go and click on any of our projects and you can see all of the history of each project. Uh, you can track the financials and you can see where it is in its progress and its completion date. Now, these uh, specific reports that have been called out in council meetings we also know through recent budget committee meetings that currently our city does not have the type of software that it needs to be regularly producing all of these reports that have been requested. We know this, and so we tried to do something about it. We didn't have it in that 
tight city budget this year to do a large software improvement, so we applied for a grant. Unfortunately, we didn't get it, but we'll apply again. It's already been stated as a priority of the city. We are moving towards that, and I think uh, if you're watching our council and our budget meetings, you will see that we are, we are trying very hard to get the finances together to improve our financial software. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mayor Drabkin, when the city no longer had oversight of the fire department, were you in favor of or opposed to taking the new, the now available taxable $1.50 per thousand dollars property evaluation to the voters to decide if they wanted that additional property tax to go to the city and why or why not? Absolutely, that's what we did. We took it to the voters. We took a ballot measure to the voters that would have two things happen. It would establish a new fire district and it would give the city its authority to retain its full property tax value. That's that $1.50 that you're mentioning. We also made a promise to the citizens that we wouldn't bring that taxing authority back online more than 50 cents per year. And the council has upheld that. And the budget committee has upheld that pledge to the community. Uh, I absolutely uh, always want the voice of the people to be guiding not only our local government, but all levels of government. The effects of the fire district have been incredible. An updated fleet. We know that regularly that 20 and 30 year old fleet, you're replacing those vehicles now. Morale is improved, I understand. Um, and your response times, I think, have also improved. Um, I think the morale piece is a huge part of it um, and goes to the fact that you no longer have days and days and days of holdovers happening, which are unkind and unfair to you who are putting yourselves on the line for us. I mentioned earlier the important services that we have a responsibility to bring to the citizens, parks, clean parks, updated infrastructure, parks programming, our parks and recreation programming, so vital to a healthy community and to creating well-being, which is why I advocated very hard for the establishment of the fire district. It's also why I advocated for putting that taxing authority decision to the people, and the people made a decision on that. Thank you. Kim. So because of my involvement in the fire department and in going to city meetings, I did understand when the $1.50 was retained, that the authority was retained by the city, and the, the money went to the fire district. I, too, support the fire district. And I think they've done amazing. Since they've left the city, they have bought new vehicles. Their morale has increased. And they have a budget. And we get to see that budget when we go to their monthly meetings. I'm impressed with Reed Godfrey and what he has done for that department. Pretty proud of it. I also understand, after through, through this campaign, I understood the taxing authority. And I under, also didn't understand that you made an agreement to only do 50 cents. Because I know at the last budget meeting there was a discussion of do we want to do a dollar, do we want to take it all? To me that doesn't sound like you made an agreement and we're staying with that. It did happen this year, but again that discussion was on the floor at the budget committee. I also understood um, that there is a city service fee that was put into place, used as a stop gap measure until that transition went through and until we had a debt that was paid off, paid off. However, that city service fee is still there and that's concerning to me and it is concerning to me that there are multiple citizens that didn't understand the $1.50 and how it would work, that the authority would stay, that the taxing would come back to you and that we're gonna have that city service fee and it's my understanding from the last budget meeting that Jessica Payne pointed out that it's on the budget and it's going to be increased. And that's concerning to me. 
We are taxing and taxing our citizens that affordable housing, we, yes, we need affordable housing, but what about the people that are in a house right now that are living on the edge, that are having a hard time? Well, we're gonna keep charging these fees, so unfortunately, you may be homeless sometime soon too. We need to care about everyone. We need to, to look at these. Why do we keep assessing fees? I want to see where we're at before anything else is assessed to the citizens of this town. Thank you. Kim, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, or DEI, are a controversial topic nationwide. Mm -hmm. Is the city's DEI committee required to be in existence? Does it affect hiring practices for the city? And what kind of local data exists to support whether it is being helpful? So I don't think a DEI committee is required to have, but I do think that there was a grant that it may have been tied to that asked for the DEI committee that we currently have. Again, that's not, I don't know the facts, and I'm sure that our current mayor can answer that for us. However, I, I feel like sometimes that we're using DEI as the principal lens when we're looking at some of our projects right now. And I'm gonna use RB Rubber, Ultimate RB. So, you know, we take a look at that and we need to look at it as fiscal responsibility and how is that going to be? I'm not sure that we started there. We kind of started there with the lens of the DEI and trying to have whether the indigenous people or the history and the open space and all of that, which is great. But I think that we need to look at that once we look at how is the physical, fiscal part of that. So, you know, we had the RFQ and the RFQ went out. I don't believe price was included in that RFQ. So I think we need to keep in mind that everybody deserves a right to belong. Everybody needs to be thought of. We need to make sure things are accessible, but it shouldn't be the, the main priority decision maker. DEI, as we've seen, we've heard, is dividing communities. What's supposed to bring people together is dividing them. The current report that the DEI committee gave to the city, it showed that most of the external people, 100% thought that we were, that the city was doing fine. The only thing that they were complaining about was that our hours weren't open, that buildings weren't open, planning department wasn't open. But as for having access for our programs, that wasn't mentioned that I saw. Thank you. Mayor Drabkin. Thank you. I'd like to talk about what DEI in government looks like. That looks like communications that are coming out of the city being in Spanish and English so that our 20% Spanish speaking population has better access to what we're trying to communicate out to the public. DEI in government looks like inclusive programming in our park system. It's the DEI that had us bring in noise-making soccer balls so that visually impaired children could sign up for soccer because they belonged and because they were being included. DEI is uh, our new park that's mindful of children that have autism and that their play structures may need to look and feel and be and constructed differently than the structures that have been made in our parks previously. DEI is fixing our sidewalks so that my godmother doesn't fall when she goes down Third Street because our historic district and all of our business districts should be accessible to anyone that needs to go there, regardless of their mobility. And what do we know about our population? We have a lot of disabled people that live here. My uh, partner here, Ms. Morris Kim, um, brought up the Northwest Rubber site. Well, many of you may know that I did a research project on this site. 
Do you know that 39% of the people that live right around that Northwest rubber site are disabled? And if you've walked around uh, Alpine Avenue recently near Grain Station, um, and you've looked down the side streets, you might notice there's no roads. There's no sidewalks. So it's not very accessible for someone in a wheelchair when they can't get to a place. So if we're building new and we're investing your dollars and our dollars, my dollars, we need to be building spaces that are accessible for our entire community. And I believe our city should be serving all of our citizens. And I am exceptionally proud of the work that I have done to make McMinnville more inclusive and more welcoming to all of our residents. Yes. Thank you. Mayor Drabkin, I noticed in the September 19th issue of the News Register that City manage, Manager Jeff Towery and others will, by now, have possibly already narrowed down police chief applicants to four and maybe down to one to be announced by November 1st. Since we're in the heart of election season and since public safety has been high on the list of many constituents' concerns, would it possibly make sense out of deference to all residents to wait on the council vote for a new political, uh, excuse me, new McMinnville police chief until after the November election and new council members are in place. The chief of police is one of the most outward facing and representative members of our executive team. Uh, they have so, that person will have so much face time with so many members of our community. Again, the city of McMinnville is a nonpartisan entity. Our police chief is not a partisan decision. Everyone's safety is not a partisan decision. We are using the same process that we hired to hire our wonderful chief Matt Scales. We have a transparent process at the city. To be honest, I don't really know what your question is rooted in. It feels like you're fishing for something that doesn't exist. Okay. Kim. Well, I'm gonna hope and that all the processes were followed that should be followed to hire a police chief, um, that everybody got to have a, a voice in that. I specifically hope that the people that are gonna work for him had a voice and were heard. A police department needs to have a good culture, as do our city, and the officers need to have the biggest voice, in my opinion, of who they're gonna work for. I was invited to the meet and greet, and unfortunately, due to family issues, I wasn't able to be there. But I appreciate the opportunity, and I know that other people in our community were able to go to a meet and greet. Um, I don't know how the final decisions are made, but I do hope that all processors were followed and we get the best candidate. I believe that both have great backgrounds, and that I'm hoping also that they will be good for our city. We need to have a police chief. I would like to have been part of that, um, not knowing who's going to run the city for the next four years. And I know we have some other positions that are coming up. We have a water and light commissioner. We have, I believe, a city finance director. And I think that really that could wait for another couple weeks and figure out who's going to be the council and who's going to be the mayor. And they should be able to have a stronger voice in selecting the next people in those positions. Thank you. Kim, looking back uh, years after the COVID restrictions, including lockdowns, people being required to get the jab, deciding whose work was essential and whose was not, mask mandates, and much more that came down from the Oregon Health Authority, 
which I think most would perceive that it negatively affected students' progress in school, students and adults' mental health, yeah. uh, businesses, employment, and still has negative effects today with negligible, if non-existent, benefit. If another unconstitutional mandate came from the state or federal government, A, would you do anything other than comply, and B, what legal or constitutional backing does city leadership such as the mayor, have for resisting it or finding locally acceptable alternatives? First, in regards to the restrictions for COVID in our last, when we had COVID, I supported some, I didn't support others. I can't imagine it had to be difficult to be in any leadership role during COVID. Um, I don't wanna go back and judge anything because that's really not fair. I would hope that if we had something similar happen today, that I would want to use common sense to have the barometer to make those decisions, to work with the health department, to work with other cities, the county, listen to the state, and listen to the citizens. I do everything in my power to balance safety with what's best for the citizens, both mentally and physically. The repercussions of to our children with what happened during COVID is very heartbreaking. There are a lot of issues that have gone with COVID. And I believe that some of those decisions that the state put on us lasted too long and caused more hardship than good. I am glad I wasn't in that position at that time, but I know that if I was put into it at this point, I could do it. And I just don't want to judge anything that you did. Thank you. Mayor Drapkin. Thank you. Sometimes it's hard to remember all the personal impacts we all suffered during COVID. I spent a lot of time sitting in the street uh, across from my parents' house when they had their windows open so we could visit because I didn't go in their home for a long time, keep them safe. I also benefited greatly with my two rescue dogs that I enjoy on a daily basis. Um, you, you said a negligible impact in your question, and I just want to first say that for those who lost family, the impact was not negligible. I also want to say that we have no way of knowing how many lives were actually saved. Now, when I took office, I took an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. And so in any natural disaster or public health crisis or any other disaster, I will always uphold my oath of office. Thank you. It's time for closing comments, and uh, Kim, you may. Almost immediately after I chose to run for mayor, I felt the support of our community. The support that has grown and grown through my campaign. The fact that they need someone that they feel has common sense, that has some empathy, that has their best interest in mind. Somebody that they want to talk to, somebody that has the ability to answer their questions, to work with others. I work very well with others. I think that I can repair some fractured relationships that we have in this community, and there are. I also think that, sorry. When we started this race, I reached out to Remy. I told Remy that I was going to be running against her and it was important for me to tell her. I also told her it was important for me to say that I'm going to be respectful and I would hold anybody accountable that I could if they were disrespectful to her personally. And I'm proud of that, that we did that. And we will continue to do that. And that's how we should always be. Everybody in this room should be that way. And our city should be ran that way. And I would like to do that. I would like to listen to you. I want to be respectful. And I will do my very best 
to listen to each and every one of you and do the best for this town. You know, I had a, a tragedy that no family should ever have to go through last week. But this community rallied around me and my family. They wrapped us in love and concern. And my family and I sat down and had a talk. And we went, you know, it's not that I, I knew I was going to keep running, but I needed to have that discussion. And my family agreed. This community has asked me to run, and they have, asked, they have supported me, and I feel that. They wrapped their arms around me, and I am going to wrap my arms around you. Let's do this. Mayor Drabkin. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Kim, for uh, choosing to do this this way with me. I think that's great. Uh, I think this is a wonderful demonstration of good leadership. And that's what your mayor and your council should be doing always, is demonstrating good leadership. So speaking of repairing relationships, when I was council president, I would say our council wasn't always demonstrating such great leadership as we've done today. There was a lot of fighting happening on the dais. Uh, that work I undertook right away with that leadership role that I had to start talking about our shared values and that our job is to solve our community's problems. Those aren't left or right or red or blue or any other qualifiers. We have shared goals. We want safe streets. We want clean parks. We want our children to be safe. We want the same type of community and safety and love that we felt when we were growing up here. That's what I want. We don't want unhoused people on our streets. We may not always agree on the methodology to solve it, as I said earlier, but we share that value. I've been your mayor for two years. In that time, I have secured and built bridges to bring in $7 million from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde to help build the Housing Authority's largest housing development that has happened in McMinnville ever. 175 units of affordable housing that's coming out yet. That's a partnership. I've brought in, excuse me, I brought in money from the state government and I've brought money in from the federal government, including $850,000 to help preserve our historic downtown, our beloved business district, the living room of our community. I prioritize our citizens, I prioritize our businesses. I am a business owner here. I understand how crucial it is that this government, that our government provides you with what you need to thrive. Your business, your family, your life. You deserve happiness. You deserve to be treated equitably and you deserve to have a city that's in service to you. And that's what I've been bringing to you. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget to vote by November 5th. Have a good evening.